Greetings, everyone. Greetings, everyone. Uh, it's been a while. We have a lot to catch up on. I know some of you missed the readings. Um, but it's been a lot going on in my little life. It's been a lot going on in the world since we've last really, really, really had a conversation and talked. Um, and you guys are back. I didn't know if you guys were actually going to show up. Um, you know how the internet is. They like you today. Don't even know who you are tomorrow. So I'm happy that you guys are filing back in. I do appreciate it. Um, like I said, it's been a lot going on. I've met a lot of great people. Um, seen some great things. Learned some new things. Um, have been inspired um, a lot. But let's get to the matter at hand. We have a lot of important things. What's going on, June from Delaware? Um, we got a lot of things to discuss. A lot of things to discuss. Um, as of today, as of the taping of this video, we are five days away from the midterms, bitch. Five days away. Now, I know today was the last day to early vote here in my home state of Maryland. If you haven't early voted, that's fine. As long as you get your fat ass up on November 6th and go do what you got to do, it's all good. Okay? Uh, but for those of you who did early vote, I didn't early vote. The reason why I didn't early vote is because I like the rush of election day. I like going in and putting my ballot in, but everybody don't have that kind of time to be going and standing in these lives. And these lives are projected to be historic for a midterm election. Um, so, with that being said, make sure that you get out the vote and do what you need to do. Miss Donald, honey, Captain Crutch, he is doing everything in his power to make sure that he keep the government red, honey. Between these goddamn rallies, these goddamn statements, you know, Aunt Lydia from Handmaid's Tale on TV live for his ass every goddamn day. It's a lot going on. But we have a duty to go and make our voices heard. Even if you don't feel like you agree with me. Um... You know, hey, at least go 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 make your point at the ballot box, bitch. That's all I'm saying. Now, um, I've been getting a lot of positive feedback. Um, I've also been getting some negative feedback. There are people who do not like that I read these books. They do not like that um, a black boy from West Baltimore um, is encouraging people to go out and vote. And to get to know the system in which they live. They're not happy. I've gotten some disturbing emails. But I'm not afraid. I'm not scared. And quite frankly, bitch, I'm not pressed. I live in Baltimore City. We got a high crime rate, bitch. That I'm not proud of. But we know a lot of people that's packing, sis. So for those of you who feel like. You have a problem with me being able to do my own thing and read and, and express my point of view as an American citizen. You can try it if you want to, bitch. But Baltimore is a very small place. And you can come here showing your ass if you want to. But it's a cake baking for you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Because we're not going to give bigots, racists, and people, quite frankly, who can't even type shit in correct grammatical form in an email. Like, bitch, if you're going to send me threats, if you're going to tell me shut my fat ass up and all of that, at least have the shit be grammatically correct, bitch. Like, it took me a couple minutes to put together exactly what the fuck you were saying, bitch. Like, if I got to figure the threat out, like, that wasn't successful. Was you and the motherfucker that was sending them bombs in the same goddamn place because he can't spell, you can't spell, how the fuck y'all want people to stop doing shit? You threaten people, bitch. You don't even... You can't even get your point across, sis. What's the tea? But we're not going to stop doing this. And you know, yeah, I haven't read in a while. I'm not reading every other day like I used to, partially because I still work a 9 to 5 and I'm doing all of these uh, great things behind the scenes that I can't share with you yet, but I will be more than happy to. Um, so I have a lot going on. 
but I do want to keep this thing going. I want you guys to keep it going. It's not about one person. It's not about Emmanuel or DDM reading a book. It's not about that. It's about us taking our futures in our hands. And even if things don't go our way, per se, still pushing shit, encouraging our youth, encouraging our children, keeping shit going and active. It don't stop here. I know we've been on this campaign for midterms, but it don't stop here. And I'm going to tell you, at first, I didn't know how to take the emails, like when, they, and there haven't been like a million of them. I don't want to make it seem like I'm getting just these death threats every day. It's been a couple um, that can't spell. But uh, I really feel like it's because we're on to something. People get the most unhinged when they know they're getting ready to face some danger. And you guys, we are going to go out and we are going to flip it. We're going to flip it. And they know that we're going to flip it. That's why all of this shit is going down. I want to give a special, send my condolences out to the victims in the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. You know, like, sis. Sis. These is, and they was all old people. Like, it wasn't even, like, young people that could have potentially fought back or something. Like, you shot up old ass people. You know what I'm saying? People that, you know, really ain't have no chance at 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 at, at getting forward. But we're not gonna let hate, we're not gonna let shade distract us from what the real mission and the real goal is. Okay? We're gonna keep this shit the fuck going. And that's all I got to say about that. Alright? Um we're going to read some sections. I, I went through fear because I wanted to read a specific section of fear because I know we haven't read, we haven't read in a while. Um, but this section in particular is about DACA, which I think is it's always been pertinent but um, or, or, or relevant rather. But in light of the immigrants or, or, or the Mexican, uh, Mexican people from South America seeking asylum um, and coming to the country. I think it's so, so important to read. Um, finally, I get to understand kind of what Ivanka is doing behind the scenes. A little bit, we're going to get into that. Um, and we're just going to, we're going to have our usual educated, but hilarious time. And I was going to, I was debating whether or not I wanted to keep reading all year. But I'm going to keep reading just because there are people who don't like the fact that I read. And I'm the type of bitch who likes to do things when I know they piss you off. So I'm going to keep doing it. You want to be petty, bitch? I'm going to be petty, too. Without further ado, we are, I believe this is chapter 16. I skipped a few chapters, but anyway. General Kelly, the Homeland Security Secretary and retired four-star Marine General, was furious when he learned that the White House was working on a compromise on immigration for DREAMers, a central issue in the immigration debate. DREAMers are immigrant children brought to the United States by their parents who, as adults, had entered illegally. Under the 2012 legislation called DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, no shade, bitch, I never really knew what that meant, and I'm not afraid to say that. I never knew what DACA actually stood for. That's what I mean, okay? President Obama had given 800,000 DREAMers protection from deportation and made work permits available to them, hoping to bring them out of the shadow economy and give them an American identity. Kelly, a hardline on immigration, was supposed to be in charge of these matters now. But Jared Kushner had been working on a back channel compromise. He had been inviting Senator Dick Durbin, the Illinois Democrat, who was number two in his party's leadership, and Lindsey Graham to his office to discuss the compromise. Graham later asked Kelly, didn't Jared tell you we've been working on this for months? We've got a fix. So, whole time, Jared and them, they were doing some back channel shit, some backdoor shit, because they know this shit is about to blow up in our face, bitch. We just, like, hold your horses. So, Jared ain't that damn stupid. Speaking of which, did anybody, did they add an interview with Jared on Van Jones? We got to look into that. Anyway, but Kelly called Bannon. 
If the son-in-law is going to run it, then have the son-in-law run it. I don't need to run it. I need to come to the president. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to be up there and be blindsided and humiliated on something that I've got to be in the loop on. Bannon believed the administration owned the hardline immigration posture except for Trump himself. He's always been soft on DACA. He believes the left-wing thing. They're all valedictorians. They're all road scholars because Ivanka over the years had told him that. Okay, so we know that he listens to his children um, in regards to this. We already know from reading these books that Donald kind of just says anything to win. Like, it's really not about the issues with him. It's about him fucking winning. So that's really what it's about. So I don't know how much of this true. This is true. I, I We got to kind of look at this through rose-colored glasses, to be honest. I mean... If he really don't believe that the, 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 the dreamers are not criminals, then bitch, you got a funny way of showing it. But anyway, Kelly voices distress the Priebus, who along with Bannon feared Kelly might quit. Get Kelly some time on the calendar, Bannon proposed. Let him come see the boss and light Jared up, because this is Jared's shit, doing stuff behind people's back. Priebus didn't do it. Get in on the fucking calendar, Bannon insisted. Priebus continued to stall. It would expose this organization in the White House. What are you talking about, Bannon asked. This was laughable. Of course Priebus didn't have control of Jared, and people were always going behind someone's back. So Bannon and Priebus both told Kelly, we'll take care of it. To go to the president would cause unnecessary consternation. We'll make sure it won't happen again, and you're going to be in the loop. Kelly, team player for the moment, didn't push it further. When he later mentioned it obliquely in the president's presence, Trump didn't respond. Lindsey Graham wandered into Bannon's West Wing office. Here's the deal. You want your wall. Trump would get wall funding in exchange for the Dreamers. Stop, Bannon said. A deal on the Dreamers was amnesty. We will never give amnesty for one person. I don't care if you build 10 fucking walls. The wall ain't good enough. It's got to be chain migration. Chain migration formerly called the Family Reunification Policy, allowed a single legal immigrant to bring close family members into the United States. Parents, children, a spouse, and in some cases, siblings. These family members would have a path to legal permanent residency or citizenship. They might be followed by a chain of their own spouses, children, parents, or siblings. Two-thirds, about 68% of legal permanent residents entered under family reunification or chain migration in 2016. This was at the heart of Trump and Bannon's anti-immigration stance. They wanted to stop illegal immigration and limit legal immigration. Bannon wanted a new stricter policy. Graham and he were not able to come close to an agreement. So this kind of gives us insight. Let's unpack this. Chain migration. Now we have been going through this. We've been watching on the news. They separating these people from their families. Not saying this may be the same thing. I could be wrong. But in my interpretation of this, this makes even more sense. Why they did that terrible act of separating children from their parents and their mothers when they brought them over here. It now makes sense. And no shade. It's kind of like how they did black people in slavery, separating families and shit. That is not something that's new to white people in America in government. No shade. That's just facts. Sis, it's a pattern. You did it to black folks. You're doing it to the people from South America. I'm just saying. You have a habit of separating people from their families. Okay? Ivanka and Jared invited Stephen Miller, the hardliner on immigration, to their house for dinner along with Durbin and Graham. All you do is listen, Bannon instructed Miller. Just go and receive. Don't fight them. I just want to hear it all. Miller reported that Ivanka and Jared thought they had Trump on some sort of deal that included funding for the wall in exchange for amnesty for 1.8 million dreamers. Bannon figured chain migration made the real number double or triple that. Three to five million new immigrants. They, th they can't think that we're dumb. So basically, they was going to go here and stop fucking with the dreamers as long as they got the wall. But see, Mother Bannon... Sith Lord, he like, uh-uh, bitch. With chain migration, 
They bring, you know, family members, um, sons, aunts, or whatever, family member over, it's going to be about double that. So, it's than, one thing about them, they can do the math. They smart as shit. I give them that. Them bitches know how to add. Some days, it seemed to Bannon that Senator Graham had moved into the West Wing. He heard his pitch on Dreamers at least three times. He thought that Graham wanted to replace McConnell as majority leader. Bannon was at the height of his war with McConnell and saw Graham as his biggest ally. Graham and Bannon were on the phone nearly every day. Bannon believed everyone hated McConnell and wanted to put the shit to him because he ran things too tight. Graham didn't talk about finding a replacement for McConnell. We've got to find a guy who will replace him, Graham said. But Graham denied he wanted McConnell's leadership job. Miss Lindsay. Now, we all know Miss Lindsay is a fucking snake. He is conniving, and that bitch know how to put a strategy together. I would not be surprised if he wanted that, especially after that performance he had in the Kavanaugh hearings, bitch. Bannon believed Graham was, at the, was the best deal maker for Republicans, but he was the establishment. Graham didn't like Bannon's nationalist agenda telling him, Bannon, that America first is bullshit. This is bullshit. And the new, in the true and practice Trump White House style, Bannon was willing to ride any horse to achieve his purposes. He called Attorney General Sessions to the White House. Their problem on immigration was now Trump. He's going to be listening to Jared and Ivanka, and Graham is the best salesman around there. He loves Graham. Graham can sell him anything. He's got Durbin. They're going to be loving up on him. We've got a fucking problem. Bannon spoke with Chris Kobach, the Secretary of State of Kansas, one of the biggest opponents of the Dreamers and the hero of the right. Kobach's idea was that he and other state attorneys generals would file suit claiming DACA was unconstitutional. Bannon and Sessions developed a plan not to defend the lawsuit. It's over, Bannon said. DACA's finished. All Trump had to say to Congress was, hey, I work at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If you've got an idea, come up and see me. See me. Trump only had to stay neutral. Okay. So, let's unpack this. I read a portion of chapter 22, by the way. So, Miss Lindsay, you know, one thing about the girls, they're crafty, sis. They know how to put a plan together. Miss Lindsay and Steve Bannon was kissing cousins for a while. Didn't know that shit. Okay. So they basically trying to say fuck the dreamers or basically using the dreamers to get the wall. So they're like, bitch, we'll let the dreamers go. If we get this wall, whole time Jared Ivanka is like, bitch, lay off the dreamers. What is the team? What is going on? Bannon like, fuck that shit, bitch. Get these motherfuckers up out of here. Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm on my wall. Ain't nobody these motherfuckers up my house. Chapter 23. As Trump was laying plans to withdraw from the Paris Accord on climate change. Now, remember the Paris Accord, bitch? I gagged when he did that dumb ass shit for clean air and energy. Priebus had it with Ivanka. The president's 35-year-old daughter and White House senior advisor effectively had free run on the West Wing. She had launched what amounted to a covert operation in support of the Paris Accord a non-binding international agreement to address climate change by voluntarily cutting greenhouse gas emissions that was reached in 2015 and evolved in 195 countries. So Ivanka, low-key like, bitch, I know my father crazy. I know the environment is going back to shit. And I know that we ain't bringing back no motherfucking coal. Let him say whatever the fuck he going to say and do this dumb ass shit while we really work on keeping this shit together. So, whole time, you need to listen to his daughter, bitch. She know him better than all of y'all. She know his ass is not all there. That's why she smile, grin, say what the fuck he want to hear, and probably go and do whatever the fuck she want to do. That's what y'all dumb asses should have been doing instead of playing all these chess games and Game of Thrones and shit. Meanwhile, this bitch is getting to work and smiling and keeping it moving. They probably going to dinner harmonious as a motherfucker. Whole time, this bitch is Cersei Lannister with the knife under the table off this bitch. But anyway... Obama had pledged to cut these emissions about 25% below the levels in 2005. This would be accomplished by 2025. He had committed $3 billion to aid underdeveloped countries in a green climate fund. 
Only one billion had been paid, and Obama had transferred half of that three days before he left office. So Obama, like, I know y'all gonna fuck my shit up in my legacy, bitch. Obama basically did some shit that you do when you know you about to get fired, bitch. You start giving out all the extensions to the customers at work. You start throwing free shit in the bag at Marshalls. Like, here, bitch, it ain't got no stick on it. Fuck it. Just take it, bitch. It's a dollar. That's basically what Obama did. He said, here, 500 million, bitch. Go here to save our planet because this nutcase getting ready to come fuck shit up. Okay? Ivanka strongly wanted her father to stick with the pro-environmental agreement. Priebus would be meeting in his office with a handful of aides from the economic team and the National Economic Council for 15 minutes and in would walk Ivanka. She would sit down and often say nothing. Because this bitch know how the game work. She just watching. She know she... See, this is the thing. Sometimes the person that you got watching is the quiet bitch. That's who you got... I remember see Ivanka in there fixing all kinds of shit, bitch. That's why you'll never see that, huh? Who is this person, previous Marvel? What is she doing? It was becoming impossible to manage the West Wing. At times, it seemed Ivanka's presence, hours a day, days in a row, was nonstop. Jared had the same squatter's rights in the West Wing. They were like a posse of second guessers, hovering, watching, interacting as family and senior advisors with the president. Ivanka planted seeds of doubt about policy and passed her father articles. When Priebus voiced his dismay, Trump regularly joked, they're Democrats. They were New Yorkers infected with the liberalism of their city roots. The president made no real effort to curtail their freelancing. Priebus believed he had run a very tight, organizationally sound Republican National Committee. The Trump White House seemed designed to upend any order or routine. So, and I don't think Bob Woodard needs to lie about this. He's been very neutral in the book. And I'm not saying his word is gospel. But this is insightful. So, if you notice, we don't really see much of Ivanka these days. We don't really hear much from her. This bitch is like Casper the Friendly Ghost. She walks in. She's like, wait a minute, you bitches is crazy. Daddy, read this article. But I still have to wonder, bitch, how much are you really doing? Because your father is really going off the edge. But at the same time, how we read it on the roaster, but how much shit have you possibly saved us from? So it's kind of like, what do you believe? Who do you believe? What's really going on? We got to unpack that a little bit, okay? At one point, Priebus had a decision memo for the president to review and sign on the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Ivanka said to her father, Mark Zuckerberg wants to talk to you. She had lined up a call between her father and the founder of Facebook. Zuckerberg was an outspoken climate change advocate. She did the same with Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, and others. At one point, she slipped a personal message from former Vice President Al Gore, one of the foremost Paris advocates, into a stack of papers on the president's desk. Trump talked to Gore, who reported to others that he actually thought Trump seemed like he might stay in. Ivanka and Jared gave a newspaper story to the president with highlighted quotes from an un uh, unnamed White House source. You know who this is? This is Steve Bannon, they said. In a West Wing filled with leakers, these tactics slowly but surely planted a distrust of Bannon with the president. So, okay, Ivanka. Okay, big Vonk. So you might be the reason why Bannon's ass really got fired, bitch. People listen to their kids. The way you get to people is through their kids. I always say that. And I feel like that may be the piece that motherfuckers might be missing. That motherfucker love that damn Ivanka. Sometimes I think a little bit too much. But he listens to that bitch. But because she's a woman and because she's his daughter, and you know how they feel about women in power right now in Washington as evidenced. After those Kavanaugh hearings, bitch. Okay. They probably dismissing Big Vonk. The Big Vonk got a cake baking for these bitches. I'm interested to see how it turns out. Porter noticed Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator in the West Wing lobby on April 5th. 
He had been Pruitt's Sherpa when Pruitt was barely confirmed by the Senate 52 to 46. Pruitt had been Oklahoma Attorney General for six years, where he ran a war against EPA regulations. They made small talk. When Pruitt walked down to the Oval Office, Porter followed. Pruitt was not on a regular schedule. This was clearly an off-the-books meeting. That was evident when Bannon showed up in the Oval Office. We need to get out of Paris, Pruitt said, handing the president a plain sheet of paper he wanted him to read when drawn from the Paris Accord. We need to get out, he said. This was a campaign commitment. Yes, Bannon said several times, we've got to do this. Make this statement, Pruitt said. This could be your press statement. Maybe read it to the reporters in the Oval Office and have the press secretary put it out as a written statement. Porter was taken aback. As staff secretary, he knew there had been no process. No one had been consulted. There had been no legal review. Pruitt and Bannon had snuck into the Oval Office and wanted an instant decision on the major international and national environmental issue of the day. Porter knew the paper on the president's desk was incendiary. Trump could pick it up, decide to read it out loud to the press, or take it to press secretary Sean Spicer, who was the press secretary at the time, and say, put this out. When he had a chance, Porter took Pruitt's draft statement from Trump's desk. Later, he told Bannon and Pruitt they could not just walk into the Oval Office this way. It was a huge process file. It was unacceptable. Okay? So these bitches, because they know Donald impulsive, this is why they be hiding memos and shit. Steve Bannon and this, this Pruitt motherfucker, they trying to be like, bitch, just go ahead and read it, bitch, because once you read it, that's it. If you have not learned anything, if we have not learned anything, Cabinet, from reading this, these books and, and going through this process, watching the news, is that you are the company you keep. I've learned this working in music and pursuing a career in entertainment. It's all about your team. If you don't have the right team, bitch, you're not going to be Cardi B. If you don't have the right team, bitch, you're not going to be Jay-Z, bitch. That's the bottom line flat out. It's all about the team. And his team is fucked up. Gary Cohn gathered the principals for a meeting on the Paris Agreement in the Situation Room on April 27th. Cohn's National Economic Council has sent around, sent around a full official use only six-page memo proposing two options. The first was to withdraw from Paris. The second was remain in the Paris Agreement but adopt a pledge that does not harm the economy and puts a hold on further financial commitments and contributions. So he like, bitch, I'm not saying we got to leave the agreement, sis. I'm just saying we ain't giving ass no more goddamn money until we see some more results, bitch. And I can get with that. I can get... Hey, don't make a payment, bitch. I owe Comcast about $200 right now, but my shit's still on. We can work with him, bitch. I will call for the extension. Shout out to Comcast. So I get him. I want to turn first to the White House counsel, Cone said, opening the meeting, to walk us through some of the legal issues. But Don McGahn was not there yet. His deputy, Greg Katz, has discussed technical issues until McGahn arrived. Great, McGahn's here, Cone said. Tee up the legal issues for us. McGahn supporting getting out, though he had not yet revealed his hand. Well... He said, we're going to have to have these court cases. And if we don't get out of Paris, then it's really going to jeopardize some of the regulatory rollback that we're likely to do at EPA. Paris is one of the justifications the Obama administration used as part of the regulatory record to justify the costs and benefits of the Clean Power Plan. That was an Obama-era 460-page rule to lower carbon dioxide emitted by power plants that the EPA estimated would save 4,500 lives a year. Pruitt was already moving to end the policy. So they're like, fuck it. Let these bitches die, bitch. 4,500 people ain't worth three billion goddamn dollars. That's basically what he's saying. So unless we exit Paris, all of these sorts of cases are going to be in jeopardy, McGann said. He was for getting out immediately. 
You don't know what you're talking about, Tillerson said. My state department legal advisor, which was the office that negotiated this in the first place and has the relevant expertise, says we can't just announce that we are getting out. The option paper clearly said the United States cannot officially announce a withdrawal from the Paris Agreement until November 2019, two and a half years away at that time. Now it's less than a year left. But the second option, remaining in an accord, but doing nothing that harmed the economy and putting a hold on further financial contributions will put the U.S. in good stead in terms of litigation, Tillerson said. The Secretary of State stood alone. Pruitt spoke strongly for getting out. Priebus, who saw the political benefits, was for getting out. Bannon saw Paris as one more globalist deal that screwed the United States. So when we look at this, Bannon is really nearsighted. Like, he does not have a world view at all. Like, his view is purely the United States. And I'm all about protecting home. Don't get it fucked up. But his view, he he's not, he doesn't understand the global stage at all. Like, at all. And it's obvious from reading all these books, he don't get it, bitch. He is not a world citizen. At the end, Cone said they obviously needed to get the legal issues squared away. But I think we're starting to get a consensus. He was right. Paris was dead. McMaster and Porter, Porter huddled before a 10 a.m. June 1st meeting with the president in the Oval Office on the Paris Accord. Trump was due to make an announcement that day. We've got to make a last-ditch effort, they agreed. Withdrawing will damage our relationships with so many other countries, McMaster said. He was inundated with calls from his counterparts. You guys aren't really thinking about doing this, are you? Or more explicitly, please don't do this. Porter had drafted some language for the president to use. The United States will withdraw from the terms of the Paris Climate Accord effective immediately. Porter read his proposal. As of today... The United States will not adhere to any financial or economic burden the Paris Accord purports to impose, including its nationally determined contribution. Withdrawing from the terms would technically leave the United States in the accord. This will read like it's tough enough, Porter argued to McMaster. He'll feel like he's getting the political bang for the buck. He'll be fulfilling the campaign promise. It'll excite the base. It was basically option two from the principals meeting. Remain in the Paris Accord. Porter thought he had found a way to minimize the damage. Porter and McMaster presented the proposed language to the president. They talked until they were blue in the face, but it was clear they lost the fight. No, Trump said. He was withdrawing Phil scale. That's the only way I could be true to my base. As Trump worked over the speech draft, he toughened the language further. So basically, Porter had figured out a way for us to withdraw, so to speak, from the Paris Climate Agreement, but not withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. And everybody would still look good. Trump would still appeal to his base. But we still, you know, wouldn't be fucked and, you know, be on oxygen machines by 2025. But Trump wasn't trying to hear that shit. In a late afternoon Rose Garden appearance that day that included a brass band the president praised the stock market and the U.S. efforts to fight terrorism. On these issues and so many more, we're following through on our commitments, and I don't want anything to get in our way. Then I'm burying the lead, he said. Therefore, in order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. So, bitch, how you go from talking about the stock market? He slid that in, bitch. How you go from talking about the stock market and terrorism with a brass band playing in the Rose Garden to, bitch, we ain't going to enjoy the roses no more. All these roses are going to die because we're going to have carbon dioxide, smog, and coal smoke fucking up our planet. As someone who clears deeply about the environment, which I do, I cannot in good conscience support a deal that punishes the United States, which is what it does. The world's leader in environmental protection while imposing no meaningful obligations on the world's leading polluters. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Oh, that was shade, bitch. That was cute. That was a cute line. But, bitch, the whole shade is you ain't representing the citizens of Pittsburgh, bitch, because they don't even want you there after that shit that happened to them people in their synagogues. The bitch, you really ain't representing no goddamn body. Anyway, on June 15, 2017, the Washington Post ran a story by three of his top Justice Department and FBI reporters headline, 
Special counsel is investigating Jared Kushner's business dealings. Mueller wanted more and more records. Kushner hired Abe Lowell, a top Washington criminal defense lawyer. Priebus could see the flames building around a string of troubled investments Jared was involved in. He decided to escalate, make a big play. He told Trump that Jared should not be in the White House in an official capacity. Nepotism laws existed for a reason. The Mueller investigation was going deeply into Jared's finances, and it will jump to your finances if it hasn't already. Normally, Trump would ignore or dismiss. This time, he paused, slowed down, and became reflective. He looked at his chief of staff. The response was Jared was jarring, so different. You're right, the president said. Priebus continued to tell Trump that as his son-in-law, Jared should not have an official position in office in the White House. But this suggestion would ricochet right back and get him in trouble with Jared, who wanted to stay. Jared remained a mission Priebus failed to accomplish. Having failed in efforts to control or curtail the president's tweeting, Priebus searched for a way to have practical impact. Since the tweets were often triggered by the president's obsessive TV watching, he looked for ways to shut off the television. But television was Trump's default activity. Sunday nights were often the worst. Trump would come back to the White House on the weekend at one of his golf networks, golf resorts, and uh, watch his enemy networks, MSNBC and CNN. The president and the first lady had separate bedrooms in the residence. Trump had a giant TV going much of the time. Alone in his bedroom with the ticker, the TiVo, and his Twitter account. Bitch, why you got TiVo? Like, you ain't got on the bed, bitch. Priebus called the presidential bedroom the devil's workshop. And the early mornings and dangerous Sunday nights, the witching hour. There was not much he could do about the mornings, but he had some control over the weekend schedule. He started scheduling Trump's Sunday returns to the White House later in the afternoon. Trump would get to the White House just before 9 p.m. when MSNBC and CNN generally turned to softer programming that did not focus on the immediate political controversies and Trump's inevitable role in it. That's true, bitch. Because at 9 o'clock, bitch, at 9 o'clock, we know Anthony Bourdain, rest his soul, come on CNN. You don't see that shit. They had the documentaries and shit. He's a small cookie. Bannon realized that the cascade of NSC presentations about Afghanistan, Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea was not completely connected with Trump. Without some organizing principle, it was too much for his attention span. So he called Sally Donnelly, a key close advisor to Secretary Mattis. Sally, you've got to talk to your boss. Here's the problem. One day the focus was Libya, the next it might be Syria. I know this guy. He's frustrated. It's too disjointed. Besides, what are we doing with the Saudis? Everything else is kind of hodgepodge. I've got something I want to talk to Mattis about, and I'll bring it over and diagram it for him. Bannon had come up with what he called the strategy of the United States. At 8 a.m. on June Saturday, Bannon arrived at the Pentagon. He had coffee with Donnelly and Mattis' chief of staff, retired Rear Admiral Kevin Sweeney. They then gathered with Mattis around the small conference table in the secretary's office. Here's my problem, Bannon said. You guys haven't thought about the Pacific at all. You haven't thought about China. There's no in-depth. You are so tied to CENTCOM, the central command that covered the Mideast and South Asia. Since Mattis had been the CENTCOM commander from 2010 to 2013, Bannon thought that Mattis had brought the mindset to the job of Secretary of Defense. He reminded Mattis that Chinese policy leaders and intellectuals were split on their views of the United States. One group saw the U.S. as an equal par partner, a co hegemon The other, the Hawks, looked at the U.S. as a lesser power and treated it like one. No shade, bitch, because it is what it is. We're going down. Mattis encountered annihilating ISIS was the assignment President Trump had specifically given him. I'll basically cut a deal with you, Bannon proposed. If Mattis would support the containment of China, he would back off on the pressure to get the U.S. out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a linchpin in the Chinese One Belt, one road plan to expand its trading network to Europe. Steve, Mattis said, I'm kind of one of those global trading guys. I think all that trade stuff's pretty good. Bannon was appalled. Trump was right. The generals didn't know anything about business and economics. 
They never really cared about the cost of anything. And those are our chapters for tonight. So basically we learned, don't nobody really like Jared and Ivanka because Jared and Ivanka be low-key trying to knock some sense into his dumb ass. And they ain't really here for it. And so they trying to get them out, but they ain't going no goddamn way. He ain't turning on his family. Um, interesting. Um, not saying that I have a new view of Ivanka and Jared, but it definitely kind of helps me put a few things in perspective. Um, first off, I'm really, you know, glad that you guys joined me tonight. I didn't know if people would actually show the fuck up because it's been a while. But I do thank you guys for joining me. Like I said, no death threat, no, you know, nasty email is going to keep me from voicing my opinion. We live in the United States. If you love this country so much and you want to make America great again, then everybody should be able to voice their fucking opinion, not just the one that you like. Now, I hope that you guys have a great weekend. I went to see, I went to the premiere, the New York premiere of Bohemian Rhapsody. Met a lot of famous folks. Um, drank with billionaires. That was interesting. Um, but it's kind of like weird. Like, it don't really have an effect on you, but it ain't your money. Because it's like, oh, you rich, bitch, but I'm getting ready to hop on the train and go back home. So it's like kind of like weird. But um, some great things are coming. Uh, working on new music and all of that and a book and a lot of endeavors. But um, you guys be blessed. Thank you for joining me and reading and, you know, staying abreast and all of that. I appreciate you guys. Um, for those of you in the Maryland area, uh, I will be doing a special holiday reading. I'm going to announce it here first, December 15th at Metro Gallery. DDM presents the Holiday Slay. Okay, where I will be reading um, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and A Charlie Brown Christmas live as only I can uh, with special performances of some of my favorite Christmas songs. We'll have some special drinks and party and have a good time. Uh, market calendars December 15th. I think the tickets go on sale Monday, but you'll see the flyer and all of that. Um, but market calendars. Um, and I will see you guys. Oh, don't forget to follow me on Instagram at G-O-D-D-M to keep up with all the madness. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the Secretary of Shade YouTube, um, subscribe there. I know some of you guys have been asking about the Secretary of Shade episodes. To be quite honest with you guys, quite frankly, when you have a lot of viewers and people see things going well for you, they think you have more money than you actually have. And when the money isn't immediate, they feel some kind of way. So we're going to bring the podcast back. It's going to be in audio format as I originally intended. And it will be on all platforms. We will be discussing politics and keeping this thing going. Um, while Monkey Don't Stop the Show, we will keep it going. I started out reading my living room. Anything can happen. You don't need 800,000 people to make it happen. With that being said, y'all be blessed. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your night. Um, be safe and y'all have a good one.